When I was growing up, I wanted to become a professional basketball player. I genuinely thought I could make it into the NBA one day. I would dream about taking a full court buzzer beater to win the game, and even starting my own line of basketball shoes. Of course, they'd be called Airs 80s. The thing is, I kept this dream a secret, because I was always told that you had to be genetically gifted to be a professional athlete, and that I probably wasn't. In fact, this idea of being gifted didn't just stop at athletics. I remember in grade 8, I had a kid in my class named Unkid, and Unkid's math skills were far beyond anyone else in my year, or even in the year above. He was so good at maths that he was put in a class with kids in grade 11. Now, it's hard to look at LeBron James, Roger Federer, or even Unkid, and not think that they have some sort of divine gift that enables them to be so good at certain things. Years later, as I now study AI and how it can be used to guide human learning, I discovered that they do have a gift, but it's just not the gift that I thought they had. This is the story of how we all have the gift, and if we can leverage it correctly, we too can become good at anything. In 1977, when Andrus Ericsson was a researcher at Carnegie Mellon University, he and his colleague Bill Chase were running an experiment to test the limits of short-term memory. They were looking for an undergraduate student with average grades and average memory abilities, so they recruited Steve Fallon. Steve would come to Ericsson's lab three to five times a week and take part in a memory span task that lasted about an hour. Ericsson read a random sequence of digits at one digit per second, and Steve's job was to repeat all the digits in the correct order back to Ericsson. If he got the sequence correct, Ericsson would increase the number of digits by one. Otherwise, he would decrease it by one. After a few sessions, Steve became visibly frustrated. He was baffled by the fact that he couldn't recall more than seven digits in a row. But what Steve didn't realize at the time was that this is exactly what Ericsson was expecting. The limit of random, unrelated items stored in an average person's short-term memory is around seven. So Steve was average. Ericsson had spent decades analyzing, testing, interviewing world experts in sports, music, academia. He wanted to understand what made them so good at what they did? What he found was that it wasn't natural ability that separated the experts from the novices, but it was a certain type of practice. A practice he refers to as deliberate practice. In order to understand deliberate practice, it's helpful to define it and contrast it with other forms of practice. In deliberate practice, students are given explicit instructions about what techniques to use to develop their skill. The techniques that are effective for beginners may cease to be effective for intermediate and advanced students. So techniques have to be tailored to the current levels and interests of the student. In deliberate practice, students are supervised by an expert teacher who is responsible for diagnosing errors, providing in-depth feedback, and addressing areas of weakness through focused training. Typically, deliberate practice sessions are short. The optimal length is between one and two hours. But teachers typically provide personalized training tasks that can be done in between sessions. Deliberate practice is intense, and the process can often be unenjoyable. However, over time, once performance gains begin to rise, so does motivation. Below deliberate practice is purposeful practice. This is the type of practice where there is a clear intention to improve performance, but the student does not frequently have access to an expert teacher to provide personalized feedback. Purposeful practice can yield performance gains, but not with the same effect as deliberate practice. This is because most beginner and intermediate students will lack an understanding of where they're going wrong. And even if they are able to identify their mistakes, they may not know the best method of how to improve those weaknesses. The last and most basic form of practice is naive practice. An example of naive practice is playing sports with your friends. These activities may have some impact on your performance, but as they're unstructured, they will typically result in the plateauing of your performance. It is this plateauing that ultimately results in people dropping the activity altogether. Remember the gift I mentioned in the beginning of the video, and how this gift is what ultimately enables any of us to become good at anything? Well, that gift is human adaptability, and the way to activate it is deliberate practice. Advancements in brain imaging have resulted in loads of new findings. One of the most significant findings is that neuroplasticity does not halt at a young age as we previously thought. In fact, research shows that even older adults are capable of experiencing not only functional brain changes, but structural brain changes too. But the big caveat is that this can only happen when we use proper techniques of practice. Oh, and Steve Fallon from earlier in the video? Well, he continued to visit Ericsson's lab for the next year and a half, and during that time, he started changing his practice techniques. After more than 230 hours of practice, Steve's ability to store digits in his short-term memory went from just seven digits to 79 digits. 
By the way, this is 79 digits. Steve's short-term memory skills were on par with some of the best known memory experts of the time, and 230 hours was a relatively short amount of time to reach that level of expertise. So whether you're trying to make music, build your coding skills, improve your fitness, or learn a new language, next time try using deliberate practice. It may mean you have to find an expert coach or a teacher, but it's the most sure shot way of actually reaching your goal. I know that for many of us, hiring a coach or a teacher isn't really a viable option. So how are we supposed to engage in deliberate practice? Well, I asked myself the same question. And as it happens, answering that question is the focus of my research at Cambridge. And even though I'm still on that journey, I genuinely believe technology and AI have an important role to play in how we learn new skills and help us all become good at anything.